All right. This morning we're going to go over uh, refrigerant system evacuation. We've already gone through some leak detection. We've talked a little about uh, the, the importance of having a good type system, leak free. Now let's talk about why it's important to pull a vacuum on a system, do a good evacuation. First of all, there is, if there's not condensables in a system, the system cannot operate correctly. Air is the main thing that can get into a system. If, if from time to time you may see some nitrogen in a system where someone didn't uh, uh, do a proper evacuation and they replace the component, but that's an unusual situation. Most of the time you're going to see air in the system. From where do, How does air get in the system? Well, it could from a leak if it was if, if it was on the uh, uh, suction side or, or the low pressure side. But more than likely, the air gets in a system at the initial installation or poor uh, service procedures. When someone <coughs> changes a component and they don't properly uh, remove the air from the system, that air is going to be locked in there, and it's a permanent thing. Now, there's a problem with just having air, it's not just the air alone. Any air is going to contain moisture. When you add the, that moisture, oil, refrigerant, and heat, you can cause other problems within the system. You can cause acid to actually form within the system and do damage to the internal parts of the system, including the motor windings. It can actually break down the insulation on the motor and cause a burnout. And a burnout is something that you don't want to have on the system. Once the system gets contaminated with the acids of a, uh, that result from a burnout, <clears throat> it's practically impossible to remove it all, even with filtrization and, and, and uh, purging. It's just practically impossible. I'm not going to say impossible. I know better than to say impossible, but it's practically impossible. The It comes down to good service procedures, good installation procedures. Bottom line, do the job right. Shortcuts don't get it in this world. That's, that's the bottom line. All right, well how do we go about doing that? Well, we've got to use a proper vacuum pump. Now, I've seen people try to take a old compressor and turn it into a vacuum pump. Doesn't work. It may remove most of the air, but it's not going to remove the moisture that it needs to. You've got to get it down into the micron levels, and the only way I know of to measure microns is through a micron electronic meter such as this. Okay. The reason being, if you ever take a look at the the vacuum side of the compound gauge, you can see that you can tell that you're in a vacuum, but you can't really tell what kind of vacuum or what level of vacuum you're at. I'll give you an example of how accurate the micron gauge is. And uh, let's do a little number comparison. If I had a complete vacuum, what would I have in pounds of pressure? Negative. Well, let's let's say let's, let's do this one. From zero to atmospheric pressure is how much? An absolute pressure. Fifteen. Right at fifteen. Fourteen point seven, roughly. But we'll say fifteen because that's an easy round number. Okay. Now, take that fifteen uh, segments and divide it by seven hundred and ninety-nine thousand. Now you got a micron. So you can see how much more accurate not microns are. In fact, in order to be able to boil the water off, and that's what you're doing, you're lowering the pressure, you're boiling the water off, getting the vapor out of there. <clears throat> You've got to get it down to the lower microns. A regular vacuum pump won't do it. I said before, a converted compressor won't do it. You've got to have a two-stage vacuum pump, one that's made to be able to get down into those low microns. Now, the capacity of the vacuum pump takes into consideration two things. Number one, can it pull a deep vacuum? 
Number two, how much volume can it pull? This is fine for most of your residential, light commercial. In fact, it, it, it can be used even in, in the heavy duty. But if you have a large system with a lot of, of uh, volume within it, then you need a vacuum pump that can do a little more than this one right here. Now keep in mind, this is a series type vacuum pump, and I'll explain that in just a minute. You can also get these vacuum pumps where they can be changed from parallel back to series, okay, with a simple flip, flip of a, a mechanical switch. Let me show you how the vacuum pump works as soon as I find a marker. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. If I had the vacuum pump, and I'm going to call this a cylinder, and this is another cylinder. Okay. If I'm pulling from my system here, it would go into one cylinder of that vacuum pump, come out of it, go into the other cylinder, and then back out to the atmosphere. That's what's called a two-stage vacuum pump, okay? Some vacuum pumps, you can actually take it and change it so that it would be doing by itself. <clears throat> That's when you parallel the cylinders for quicker volumes. You don't see that being used, like I say, in the residential and light commercial, but you, I, I don't know what you're going to be into. And I want to at least let you know that those things are out there, okay? Now, the oil in the vacuum pump is very, very important part of it. Number one, without oil, we've got a problem anyhow. It's going to seize up. All right? But you've got to keep that oil clean. Now, changing the oil on the vacuum pump, that's your life for your vacuum pump. If you use the vacuum pump to evacuate a system that has been contaminated, don't let that oil sit in there. Anything that was in that system is going to be in that oil. So if you have got uh, an a, a acid type condition in that system and you pull the vacuum, you're now going to have that acid in the oil. It's not that hard to change. In fact, I'll tell you how important the oil is in there. The oil is what actually creates the seal between, between the walls of the cylinder and the piston so that it can pull the proper vacuum. Okay? If you got dirty oil, you're not going to pull a good vacuum. Okay? Alright, let's talk a little bit about other contaminants that may be in the system. By the way, I, I, I jumped on something a while ago and I, I didn't finish it. If you got air in the system, you got more. I mean, that's, that's all it is to it. You know, how, how, well, you say, well, how in the world could I have moisture? I guarantee you, any air that may be left in the system is going to have moisture. And we're not talking about large amounts of moisture. We're not talking about something that you're going to be able to see. We're talking about molecules of moisture. Okay? So don't, don't think that, you know, you think that, don't be thinking like a glass of water. Not, nothing like that. Okay? Think about as I said before, in a vapor form. All right. You know, there's one thing that you're not going to be able to get out, though. If you're working on a deep freezer, for example, or a walk-in freezer, and you've done everything correct, you've changed a major component, you're vacuuming in the system. Let's say, for example, that we have several refrigeration systems on this one walk-in, walk-in freezer. That walk-in freezer is still going to be below uh, 32 degrees inside of it, right? Okay. What if you have ice inside the coil, particles of ice? You can vacuum on it all day long. They're not going to remove that moisture out of there because it's in an ice form or solid form. Well, how, what, how are you going to take care of that? Well, turn on the defrost heaters is one. If it has defrost heaters, if it doesn't, Get a hot, hot lamp or something like that. Put <clears throat> some form of heat in that area so that you can get that coal up or those parts of the system that are below freezing up to temperature above, uh, above the freezing point. One of the problems that we run into 